Hi, everybody. Um, so welcome. My name is Dr. Taylor Capazello, and I'm going to be talking to you guys today a little bit about breathing biofeedback. Um, it is, to myself, one of the most important parts about it because we are changing the body from the bottom up. Um, you know, so if we do neurofeedback, we're addressing it another way. If we just do uh, biofeedback, when I first got into this, I thought, you know, muscle biofeedback and all these other things were really cool, but we always had to start at breathing. And once breathing was addressed, then we could move into the other things. And usually we move pretty fast through everything else if we had a really solid foundation in breathing. So I'm excited to talk to you guys about that. Today's goal is going to be learning how to teach diaphragmatic breathing. I feel like we get into this field and we know about six breaths per minute, but we don't really understand how we're supposed to teach at, what that's supposed to look like, and why, because clients are going to ask questions. And so we want to be able to answer them and really understand it on a deeper level. So why are we wanting to change our breathing patterns? So everybody that comes in, I, you know, even my yoga uh, clients, they come in, they think that they might understand breathing but they don't. And so we need to teach them what we're asking them to do, that we're, you know, changing up their breathing patterns and that they're, you know, learning how to take control over their body. They have to understand why they want to do this because you can tell anyone to do something. It's good for your health, but if you don't actually understand why, then you're not going to add it into your practice. So we want them to understand about how it increases anxiety when we're over breathing, when we're breathing into the chest. And we also want them to understand that we're changing muscle tension as we start to breathe differently. So we're going to start to learn how to isolate our upper body from our lower body. So we're getting into muscle isolations as well. Just like I was saying, understanding why. Why is this important to them? What changes is it going to make for them? What are they going to see how is that going to feel for them? So we have to see as our job as a practitioner is to guide them into making those choices. So just like all therapists, we're not just telling them what to do. We're guiding them so they start making those choices and they figure out why it works for them. We want to show them the scientific research of what it means in addition to understanding how it feels in their body through practice. One of the first things that's nice to go over is the anatomy of breathing. Most people think, okay, well, we breathe into our belly and our chest and they don't understand how it works. And there's actually four muscles that are involved in breathing and they're not any of the chest muscles. The chest muscles are called the accessory breathing muscles. So when we're talking, we're running, we're going to use these chest muscles. But in our daily life, when we're just passively breathing, they're pretty non-existent for this. The ones that are important is our rectus abdominis, our abdominal muscles, our diaphragm, our pelvic floor, which is a really big one on it. And we have some of the intercostals as well, which is the muscles between the ribs that are going to flare out. So they're, they're just kind of guiding everything, but those three muscles are the main ones. So as somebody learns this, you realize, oh, these, these aren't the muscles that I was using because people are taught, oh, breathe into the belly and into the chest. And that's one style of breathing, but it's not the style that we're looking at. Then we want to have them understand how the lungs function, because if a person is not understanding how their body is using and pulling in air due to physics, then they're once again not going to understand why they're having to do these things. And later we're going to show examples of how to do this. But my favorite, and I love this one picture, and I show it to every client. So we're going to see here, and I ask them, well, how are we going to bring air to that lung, the, the red balloon? And normally what we might do is try to expand that hard plastic, which isn't very ergonomic. We're not really using the correct space when we do that. It's a lot of extra work. But instead, if we pull down that green balloon, that diaphragm, then air is just going to effortlessly pull in. So without doing any work, we're just creating a vacuum. So we will do that in an exercise in a little bit to explain that more. Then we have the circulatory and respiratory connection of how it works with the blood and the lungs for how it's interchanging. We're having a uh, exchange of gases that's happening at the lung level and at, at the blood level as well. So we want our tissues to have enough oxygen 
We want them to be expelling carbon dioxide and not holding on to it. And I'm not going to get into it today, but you are needing that carbon dioxide to let go of oxygen. So having enough exhaling long enough for that carbon dioxide is also vital for your tissues obtaining oxygen. There's a nice um, marriage that happens between the two of them. So that's a really vital part um, for it. Now we're going to get into balancing. So obviously there's so much more on anatomy and we could spend an entire class on that, but this is what I like to go over with my clients and we don't have to go too deep on it. So we're, I'm kind of going through how I would go through with a client, um, although it might be broken up in other things. And we're going to also go over how to go through this with clients later. So we want to get into a balancing part. So our nervous system with stress is obviously going to wreak havoc on our system if we're always stressed out. And one of the things that's really interesting is that if we breathe differently, then our nervous system is going to respond to that. So if we hold our breath in our chest all the time, we're going to start to have anxiety. But if we switch to diaphragmatic and we have a nice soft chest, then our nervous system starts to calm down. This also works with uh, vagal nerves, which we'll get into just a little bit. But we have the sympathetic which as we inhale, sympathetic system becomes dominant. And as we exhale, the parasympathetic nervous system becomes dominant. So we're creating a balance. This is not a relaxation exercise. This is a balance between the two nervous systems and creating a healthy atmosphere for that. So the bracing that I was talking about can also be called dyspnesis, uh, learned disuse. Uh, it can have other names as well, but it's a pattern where we hold in our chest and many people don't even realize they're doing it. And later I'm going to talk about a way to have yourself and your clients check in on that one pattern, but that pattern is going to use our accessory breathing muscles and it's going to put us into more of a fight or flight stance than a rest and digest, not having that balance of the two of them. It changes the muscle contraction. And one of the things that I like thinking about is if we're keeping our abdomen tight all the time, and if we're eating food and we're having, you know, food go down there and then we're tightening all the muscles around it, then blood flow isn't working as well. So if you take your wrist and you tighten it this way, you eventually start to lose some blood flow in your hands. And the same is true in the gut. So we want to have that soft. So blood flow is going, all the nutrients, all the good things that we're putting into our body or bad <laughs> are able to be properly digested and work and, and massaged essentially. So through relaxing those muscles, we're getting uh, more blood flow to that area. What's paced breathing? Everyone talks about it, but what is it? And it's really just that, finding a proper pace for an inhale and an exhale ratio, which gives a client time to slow down, become much more aware of themselves. And something, if we're doing biofeedback, they can follow a pacer that allows them to start tracking and you can start changing their breathing patterns. Because if we just say, breathe slower or we tell them what to do, it's a little hard for them to know, especially as they're learning all these new skills. So by having a pacer, that takes that mindless part out of it so they can focus on on what they need to in their body and they're just following that pacer for however you set it up based off of uh, your intake. From doing the pace breathing, it's going to change the uh, vascular relaxation, which can help and reduce blood flow, a lot of other techniques, such as Qigong, Tai Chi, they all naturally do this. They're naturally starting to change the breathing to make it that you're responding this way, that your body is coming into this state of uh, relaxation and excitation at the same time. And um, Qigong, we won't get to talk to too much about today, but it is another really cool thing for breathing as well. So it's another uh, method that you can always apply and I uh, if there's time to bend, I'll go over that a little bit. So how do we do pace breathing? With pace breathing, there's lots of different ways. Um, as you can see in this list, um, you know, you can you can do it kind of any way. There's, you know, as therapists, we find the ways that we like to do it. So I can tell you how I like to do it. I like to have a ratio breath that I set up and it's about two and a half seconds in, uh, one second pause at the top six seconds exhale and a one second pause at the bottom and I'll show you all that in a little bit. 
I like doing this because it really forces people to learn their body. Um, that's my personal way. Um, but if I'm working with a kid or somebody that that's just not possible, we might do more of a one-to-one -one ratio, three uh, seconds in, one second at the top, and then three seconds out, figuring out what works for our client. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Why do we want to belly breathe? Why don't we want to breathe in our chest, especially if that's how we're all breathing anyways? Why are we breathing that way? When we breathe in our belly, it's going to promote the, the blood flow through our posture because we're going to have to have correct posture as our body's working. So it's making it that we're getting more of that blood flow. We're getting it like we we're talking about to the guts, to the intestines, having that blood flow go there. And, you know, if we're massaging our guts, we are maintaining good gut health. There's a reason why this has such a high efficacy rating for people with IBS, because it is so good on the guts for getting a massage there. It's not just for pushing belly out, pulling it in, pushing it out, pulling it in. We're going to learn how to soften those guts and really get them to move a little bit. Taking it a step further, we're going to balance the body through energy. And a lot of times this is where we can get into Qigong. But for today, we won't be able to go too much into it. We want to start listening and hearing what our body is telling us. So if we're thirsty or we think we're hungry, you know, we a lot of times we think we're hungry and we go to eat, but we're actually thirsty. So it's starting to listen to our body, teaching our clients to start listening to ourselves. What is it that we're actually feeling? Why is this feeling that way? And does it hurt when we do this? Or is this a pattern that's, that we're coming up against? How are we holding our body? Why are we holding our body that way? I, I notice a lot of times if I'm just sitting there and I just check in, I do a little scan, I have one seat bone that will be a little bit more forward. And it's usually the right shoulder side, you know, for leaning forward for a mouse. So I can realize that I can adjust my body, bring my shoulder back and just taking a moment to listen. When we start listening, we can start seeing if our body feels off. A lot of times when doing this breathing pattern with clients, they might feel pain in a certain area. And I'm going to ask them to sit with it and see if they are tightening muscles around there, if they can soften into it. If they can't, that's fine. And then let's start doing a workaround. But I want them to scan through and see why they're having a discomfort and can we soften anything else around or what else is going on that could be contributing to that. Expanding on that is as we breathe, we can feel how our body moves. So as we start to breathe in, we can feel our body start to open and close. So I personally will feel my palms actually start to move. And on the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about the accordion theory. So as we open up, our shoulders roll backwards, our palms kind of roll up a little bit, our back arches. Our chin kind of comes up a little bit and our pelvis tilts forward. And as we exhale, they all come back in. So the palms roll in. And this is us feeling how our body breathes if we allow it. When we do this, air is just going to effortlessly come in. We're not having to do a lot of extra work for it. So it's a, it's a really cool way of getting to know your body and seeing how it's naturally breathing. It's always breathing. So as soon as we start doing a, a training, people want to overwork, but we don't have to. We can actually just be allowing and noticing and then taking it a couple steps further to uh, elaborate on it. And this is the accordion analogy that I was talking about. We're both like the accordion and the accordion player. We open and we close. I like to think of it as having the accordion lower on uh, my abdomen so be because I am leading with my abdomen already. So as we open, that area opens. Once again, we kind of open up this way. This is ex extreme, you know, and then we close in at pushing all the air out. That body, every single thing, our pelvis, our upper body pushes all the air out and then pulls it. When we're doing this, we can also start scanning our body more. So I have in here the thing talking about how our bodies open up, the back and the neck arching, like I said, our chin lifts, the eyes will actually feel a little tighter. So as we inhale, our eyes are going to get a little brighter and the world's going to get a little sharper. 
And then as we exhale, moisture comes back into our eyes and it gets a little softer and squishier and a little less sharp. Eyes are a really good one. I really like to have clients notice that because that's so much easier for them than noticing how their body is. So when they can actually see how their eyes change between an inhale and exhale, it makes it a lot easier for them to trust everything else that they're learning. I also mentioned about the golden ball and that gets into the Qigong and I'll talk a little bit about that, but really having that golden ball on our pelvic floor, that weight, our center of gravity is moving with breath. So once again, as we breathe in, that weight in our pelvic floor moves forward and then it rolls back. We're going to deepen into that a little bit. As we exhale, same thing, we start coming back. That heaviness in our gut starts coming back, pressing against the double arch that we had in our neck and our low back. Start pressing into the chair. We elongate here a little bit and our chin comes down. Our eyes are going to soften. So we do the exact opposite. While we breathe, for every single breath, there's going to be an opposite muscle. So as we breathe in, we're going to see right here stretch out and back here gets tight. And then as we exhale, here is it's going to go opposite. So here now we can exhale, this tightens and this stretches. So there's not any muscles that are going to change between the inhale and the exhale. And the person, your client or yourself are going to start to learn about that and expand on it. This is the golden ball I was talking about. In Qigong, it's really about a circular breathing and begins in the belly. It's diaphragmatic breathing. There's a whole bunch of really cool things on it and how to check in and play with your breathing in different areas. But what I like to have my clients take away is the concept of this golden ball. And in Qigong, you're, you can move this golden ball and you feel the weight. It's kind of a fake it till you make it and you're feeling it. And in this golden ball, I like to have it sit on my pelvic floor. And so as I breathe, I feel it move and move back with that weight. So once again, as I breathe in, it's going to move forward my back arches and that golden ball, that heaviness, that you know, center of gravity goes towards the front of my pelvis. And as I exhale and soften, keeping my gut soft, it, it moves towards my sacrum. So moving back as that arch of my back presses into the chair. It's a really nice way for people if they need it. Once again, you're going to learn with all your clients what works for them. So we're having lots of tools for uh, as you're working with clients on, on what could potentially be the right thing. And if something's not vibing with them, then you can move on to the next thing. Going into it deeper on it. So manipulating, changing it, and starting to learn how to not have that feeling up here in the chest. So when clients first come in, I always tell them it's like their golden balls up in the chest in the beginning, doing chest breathing. And then next, they're going to be... As they learn the mechanics, they shift it to their uh, uh, solar plex, which is right here. And then as they really start getting better, we shift it down to their pelvic floor. So between their belly button and their pelvic floor. And that's more of the master's level that will happen. So they'll, they'll be shifting that golden ball lower as they learn how to do things. When we breathe like this, it starts allowing our neck and our body to start relaxing. Once again, always back to increased blood flow, right? And making it that everything, organs, everything is getting that blood flow, which is making us perform optimally. Normally, I'll go into that one a little bit more. But for today, I'm going to kind of keep it a little more on, on this route. When we get into Qigong, it's a lot more of the mindfulness approach. So we're going to go over the mechanics today. And I want you to think in the mind about the mindfulness part. So as a client gets the mechanics, and then we start dropping our center of gravity later. So now we're going to start going over a little bit more of the mechanics. So these are the tips that I like to use with all my clients. Once again, our goal is to guide clients, to help them, to check in with them, see how they're feeling. Uh, adjust their breathing if we need to, seeing how they're responding. Even they might be saying one thing, but we're watching their body respond a different way. We want to be clued into those things and make little adjustments and see what works for each client. So I have for every client, I have my notes and what things we went over, what things that they liked or didn't like. I have some clients that are, you know, 
have certain ways that they like how wordy it is and they don't like something and they like something else. So I want to make sure that somebody knows. And then I have that all in an Excel spreadsheet. So the second that client's coming in, I pull up their notes and I'll just add to it. And it's a really nice way of tracking. Also making sure I don't repeat certain things with them because I don't always do everything in the exact order with every client because everyone comes in different stages. We want to check in with our client because we want to make sure that they are also checking in with themselves, that they're asking themselves why they're doing this, how it's helping them, what's going on for that. Because once again, we don't want them just to be doing it to do it. We want them to start having a relationship with their body and how how that feels to them because we're not always going to be there and what's it feel like for them at home. Everyone asks, what do we set the pace at? Like I said, I pretty much set the pace the same for almost everybody and they're all able to figure it out. Um, if I have a kid, I have it slower. But everybody else, and they all start off being like, this is too fast in the, for the inhale and too long for the exhale, but they all have figured it out. I've been doing this for years and I have yet to come across anyone that can't figure it out and they all eventually love it so much more. That said, you will figure out what works for you. So I tend to do a really fast inhale because we're going to work on it in a second. You're going to see that that inhale can be almost effortless. And then the exhale is where we get a lot of work. We spend a little bit more time in that parasympathetic, which in normal life, we're not in usually too much. So I think it's nice to have a little bit longer time. It increases our carbon dioxide time to exhale, which like I talked at the very beginning, is helpful for the oxygen in the tissue level. So. Um, but you can set the pacer anywhere between six and 10 breaths. And some people, um, especially if you're teaching, not this is an exercise, but how they're going to breathe daily, they're going to breathe more frequently between 10 and 14. So depends on what you're working on. One of my favorite things to talk about is words. Um, I don't know if anybody here has had any background in hypnotherapy, but it really does change things. So one of my favorite stories is when I first was starting out, I had um, was with my one of my teachers, they talked about how um, if you, you know, hurt yourself, you burned your hand or something like that, and you relaxed after you would have blister. So for years after I kept burning myself and I would try and relax and then I would always blister and it never stopped anything. I ended up taking a class with the same professor years later, and I heard that he said, allow and notice and changing your vocabulary. And somehow that week I burnt myself making popcorn and I immediately went to, oh, let me try. And then I was like, no, wait, let me allow. And when I allowed, it changed everything. Uh, the pain didn't get really strong, but then it just dissipated after that. And I didn't blister. So it's this interesting thing of changing it. When we are trying, we're sending a signal from our brain down to our body, which is going to most likely tighten the muscle. But if we notice and we allow, then we are sending a signal up, just noticing it and we're not causing a muscle contraction from it. So we're, we're going to have it be a lot easier. So we always want passive verbs uh, versus active if, if that can be done. Uh, hypnotherapy is also another way of, of words mattering just let go. Allowing them to do that with hypnotherapy, we always are hypnotized with TV, other sorts of things um, in daily life. If somebody comes up to you and you just injured yourself and their response is, oh my God, that looks so bad. Your body is going to hurt and it's going to be bad. But if they come up, they're calm. They're like, hey, seen this before. You're going to be able to handle this. The person is so much more likely to. So this is a low level of hypnotherapy. And we are able to do that as well for showing our clients things. So words are really important. We want to shift from chest breathing to belly breathing. And the other ways, there is autogenic training that's really good. I highly recommend looking into that. It breathes me. That's a way of self-hypnosis. Your client can do that themselves. It's really great. Um, you want to practice and you want to demonstrate. You want to show the client's how to exhale. So I'm going to, in a later slide, show you the exhale, but I like to do a martial arts sound. Of... And I like that sound. If you want to try it, I highly recommend it because one, it kicks in your diaphragm and your rectus abdominis correctly. 
And as long as you're making that sound, there's still air there. So you know that you've reached the end of your exhale by the time there's no sound coming out. It does slightly tighten the shoulders a little bit, and you can come back to that later. It's just something to note. But it's really nice because clients then can just make that sound. It can be a martial arts sound, or if you um, are pretending like you're fogging up glass, you're like, ah. same thing. Um, also want to use imagery. We want to have the client. So one of the other things I might say is as you're exhaling, feeling like your belly button is coming back towards your spine. So we're going to come up with all these different images for clients. So once again, in your notes, you're going to figure out what works for them and you're going to uh, take, take note of that. This is my favorite. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Manual feedback. So for myself, I was a massage therapist for 18 years. So I'm used to touching people, palpating and seeing what's going on. As therapists, we can't always do that. So you may or may not be able to touch your client here, but they can also put their hand themselves. So this way is placing your hand right here. And the pectoralis muscles are really sensitive, especially if someone's always chest breathing. So it's a really nice way for a person to feel if they're breathing in their chest, that if it feels as they come against it and they feel these ribs expand out, then we know they're breathing in their chest. But if they breathe in their belly and it's soft and these muscles are supple, then they're learning how to use their lower body, isolate the muscles. So this is my favorite, favorite, favorite one. All my clients on the, they put their hand there. I recommend putting your elbow on something like a desk or a chair and you can feel that. You can just lightly do it, but you can also put your finger straight down to really feel. That one of the best ones. I really hope that you take that into your practice because you will, um, they will greatly benefit from it and you're going to learn a lot. Breathing biofeedback. Let's go a little bit into what it looks like as we're teaching our clients. If you're on this call, you probably know about biofeedback, but it's giving us feedback of our own biology. It's giving us those tools to see what's going on instead of just doing it because we're supposed to. So once again, we're using this to show our clients why they want to do it. This is part of it. They're going to see how their physiology changes. So we might add muscle tension or you know, we might add hand temperature so they can see how their hand temperature changes as they breathe correctly. Lots of different things we can add to it. But even just on the screen, they're going to see how their physiology changes. Before training for diaphragmatic breathing, people talk about how, you know, the goals on going through it. And like I said, there's a whole bunch of ways. And because of time, I'm just talking about my favorite way what I do with most of my clients. The first couple sessions is going to be a uh, demonstration and the mechanics of it. So we're really getting into having them get used to what it feels like to shift their breath. Then we get into the mechanics of it. And then we're going to get into the mindfulness part of the end. So, you know, and it's all based off of where they are. Um, sometimes it can be done really fast. If this is with my neurofeedback clients, I only do this for 10 minutes each time. So probably by 10 sessions, we get to the, uh, the mindfulness aspect of it. If someone's coming into me just for breathing biofeedback, we have a lot more time. Um, so I'm probably doing this between three at maximum eight sessions, usually three to five sessions. It's a lot of information though for people. So it's nice to break it down. And we want to keep reminding our clients, softening their chest, allowing their belly to work and noticing how their body moves. So as we teach the mechanics, we're going to keep coming back to keeping this soft. We're going to keep isolating those muscles. And every time we add a new thing that that person works on, they're going to tighten up here and that's okay. And then they, you know, about every two to three breaths, come back and soften the chest again. Then keep adding in what they're working on. For how a person breathes in, we can, th this is one of, um, so there's three things that I like having people learn. This is the mechanics of it. This is the demonstrations and we can do these things together. So I hope that you do this right now with me. So we're going to be doing for the demonstration I'm going to have you place your hand loosely over your mouth and you'd have your client do this as well. I do it with my clients too, so they don't feel funny. We're going to kind of have it so you can feel the air come through here and through here, like, like that. And when we do that, we're just going to loosely cover it. We're going to exhale out as much as possible. Don't worry about how you're doing it for this. It doesn't matter. 
And then you're just going to let your gut go. You're just going to let your belly flop out. Okay. So let's do that once. Exhale and flop. Good. So you should have noticed that air just pulled straight into your mouth. And if you didn't, try it again. And this is what we were talking about when we were looking at the pulling down the diaphragm balloon, having air just come in. So we have completely deflated the lungs and then we have softened the gut, which just naturally pulled that diaphragm down. Air swishes it. That's it. That gets you like 60, 70% of the air comes in. That's almost all you need. So when we look at how much time we need to breathe in, not much because you've exhaled, you've created this vacuum. That air is just going to pop right in without you doing much work. But that's not entirely enough air. So this next part, we're going to go on uh, for uh, the last part. So we've softened the gut that pulls in most of the air, but not enough for what we're doing. Enough for your normal daily life of a soft belly breath, but not enough for this exercise. So now what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you push your belly out as if you were pregnant or looking extra big. So just push it out. Don't breathe in purposefully. Just push that belly out all big. And now that you're the exhale. So when we push our belly out, that expands your diaphragm even more, which then brings even more air in, a lot more air. And we can push out in the front and the sides too. So not only do we have this, but we also have this area that we can kind of flare out. Or I talk to clients calling it kind of their fish gills that open up to the side. So if pregnant is not a good one, we might want to think about the opening up the sides of fish gills. So we flop that belly open after that full exhale, and then we push out just a little more. And now we have all the air we need. And that there's no way that that's going to take you after practice longer than two and a half seconds of just flopping it, push out. That's it. Now we're going to go a little bit into the exhale. So the exhale, the sound that I was just saying. So we're going to make that sound up. See if you can do it with keeping your chest soft. And this is something that you want to play with. And it, the chest soft through that sound is not going to be natural. So it is a constant soften exhale, soften exhale that we're learning to check in with our body. We're making that sound until there's no more sound left. So go. And then we flop, push our belly out, and then we start over. So that is the third component, the exhale. And there's one final one that we're going to go over. And this one, I add in a little bit of an extra part to it. Um, we're going to add in that we uh, are going to hear. This is another thing I really like with clients learning, because once again, they're going to learn why they probably do this breathing pattern. So I have clients plug their ears and I ask them to do three breaths and you're going to uh, exhale completely. Doesn't matter how you inhale, how you exhale, exhale completely and then just sit there, sit there for just, it's not a, it's not a, you know, a, a, you know, trying to sit as long as possible without air. It's usually about five to eight seconds until your body says now to breathe. And then I want you to inhale and exhale. However, again, get all your air out. And so we're going to do three breaths of that. So I'm going to do that with you guys, okay? So we'll do three breaths. I want you to see what it feels like to have no air. And I want you to develop a little bit of a relationship of what it feels like. Because when we do this in our practice, um, breathing, we only are going to sit down there for one second. So I want you to have a relationship so you know what to go to, what it feels like that you've reached that emptiness. So, um, and then I'll tell you why we plug our ears. But uh, so I'm going to have you plug your ears. You can close your eyes and let's do three breaths. Okay.
So that might take a little longer for some people. And I like three because it really lets you notice it. So first thing is I want you to think about how loud your breathing was. And when we plug our ears, we're aware of how loud our breathing is. And when we think about in the world, we're constantly holding our breath so we can hear better. Because before, so at some point, if you're walking through nature, hear rustle, you pause, you assess the situation because breathing is loud and we want to hear what's going on. Oh, it's a bird. We should relax. Continue on. I live in the city. I, you know, I want to be aware of what's going on. There's bikes, there's cars, there's pedestrians all around me. My cell phone's vibrating. I'm constantly coming to this state. So I have to learn how to also constantly listen. And during certain times, I might want to be there, but I want to know what it feels like to come back. So I only have people practice without, with it, plugging the ears once, just so they have an understanding of why we're always in this brace pattern. But then also, I want to go into how it felt for you sitting there with no breath and have your clients also elaborate on what it felt like. And for some people, it might not feel safe. So you're going to want to make sure that you know about those things. Uh, but for myself, it kind of feels like a dark comfort. I know, start to know what it feels like. So when I do my practice and I exhale completely, I want to make sure that I end at that point and I can kind of say hi to that one spot that I've now developed a relationship with. So now we've done all the components of breathing. So we're going to go over that. So we're going to practice. Here is the tracer lines that I tend to use. So the, we have the inhale, the pause, exhale, the pause at the bottom. So when we just soften our gut, like we talked about after a full exhale, it's going to bring that ball up close to where you see right there, that blue ball. It almost to the top. We've almost brought in enough air. So this is going to get most of us to that spot, 60 to 70%. So that's part of the breathing. So then we're going to push our belly out just a little bit more. That's going to bring us all the way to the top. So those two parts that we worked on, soften the gut, lay out those lower ribs, push it out like pregnant or like fish gills, holes in the rest of the air. Then we're going to sit for the top. At both the top and the bottom, we have these one second little gifts of meditation because as a person gets really good at this, it's boring. So we want to have these little gifts of meditation that we're saying hi to. So we're saying hi at the top with having our belly nice and full, our ribs flexed out, and then at the bottom with no air. So we're going to want to pause for that count of one, and then we're going to start exhaling. So we're going to exhale all the way and making that sound. You don't have to make that sound, but it's really nice for learning. So you might want to like use that a little bit as a tool every now and then. I personally teach with mouth open because it's hard enough. And then as a person gets good, they can start doing nasal breathing. But when we first do nasal breathing, our nasal passages aren't usually open enough. And so they take training. So I'm like, let's get this good. And then let's go to that because there's lots of health benefits with nasal breathing. But we want to be able to have a really good platform for a person to start off from. So that's why I do open mouth for when I'm teaching clients until they get to a certain spot. So once again, so now we're exhaling, we're pulling that belly button back towards that spine, exhaling out all the way. We're basically spring loading that belly button to once we get at the bottom, letting go and starting over again. So that's our whole breath is those components, those parts that we taught our clients in sections and they start to pull it together. And as a client learns, they're not just going to be seamless on it. I usually will cite it over as they're doing it. I will say, you know, soften your gut, push your belly out, exhaling all the way, pulling your belly button back, pull your belly out. And though, and I tell them, you're only going to pick up one or two of these things, but I'm just going to keep repeating them and you pick up for what feels right as you go. Now we're going to go over it again. Everything is repetitive. So you, it, does it can feel a little bit more digestible. So step one and practice with me, everybody. We're going to soften the belly, letting those intestines take up space and fall out that belly button and moving away from the spine with that back slightly arching, the neck arching, palms roll out, feeling that center of gravity roll forward. Okay. And then as we near the top of the inhale, we're going to push our belly out a little further, which effortlessly pulls that air in. And at the peak, we're going to pause for a second. Just notice that feeling. 
And then we're going to start that exhale nice and steady because that person's going to learn how to make it nice and steady as they go down. They're going to learn how to pace themselves for that pacer. <laughs> and as we exhale, we're going to have the feeling of that center of gravity rolling back towards our sacrum. Our arch in our back starts pressing into the chair. Our shoulders roll forward a little bit. We make that sound exhaling out, feeling our body come in like the accordion. Our eyes get softer and squishier. At the end of the exhale, we should have no more air left. We should have timed that correctly. That's going to be a whole other thing. Your client will keep playing with on timing. And now they're going to feel that sensation that they develop a relationship with for one second, saying hi to that emptiness. And then they're going to flip their belly out again and we're going to start over. So this is a cycle that keeps going and there's so many parts to it. And that's why with clients, we start with really simple. I don't even do all the mechanics in one session, usually two and two. Um, the first session might just them getting used to what it feels like to breathe at the slower rate, placing their hand on and starting to learn how much they're in their chest. So it might just be that, might just be slowing down their breath and taking out that extra tension in here. As they're doing this, we want them to start noticing because remember they need to know what it feels like. So when they're practicing at home, they're practicing without you, they have a relationship with it. How does it feel to have your pelvic floor move? Can you notice how the muscles are pulling your pelvic floor in? So your pelvic floor pulls up and your rectus abdominis pulls your pelvis in. And then they both let go and your pelvis rolls out. How's that feel to have those muscles pulling those bones? How's it feel to have your legs, which should just kind of be dead weight, they actually start pulling in as well. And then they just open and let go. How does it feel to have your arms, these dead weight limbs, kind of move with the breath and developing that relationship and seeing if they can see the difference between an inhale and an exhale. I oftentimes, as a client, it's really good. So after we've done several sessions, say pick three body parts, do three breaths for each one and notice the change between the inhale and the exhale, because almost every single thing on your body is going to change slightly between the inhale and the exhale, whether it's pressure on your feet, on your hands, on the pole, everything is going to change um, between that inhale and the exhale. How does it feel to relax your body? And do you have any sensations that you're feeling? Are you able to shift that energy? Did, was it hard? And how, how did this feel before and after? Those can also be really good tools. We want to review this experience so it ingrains into their head once again why they're doing it, feeling how they felt before and after and how it's benefiting them. So later, say they forget to do it and years go by and they're like, hey, I don't feel as good as I used to, but I did when I was doing that. And I remember what it felt like so they can come back to it. So we really anchored it to them. How's this going to look in your practice? This is not always how I do it. This is um, a pretty common way where people will have somebody breathe first to see what their baseline is and then they're going to teach them and then they're going to see how they are. They might even remove the screens. I personally don't do that. Um, I, I, you know, they came to me, they know that their breathing has a problem and we're going to change it. Um, I might do that if I'm doing capnometry and looking at their end tidal CO2 for them to see. But when I'm really just teaching them this, I don't need to. But some people love having a pre and post baseline. So I just want to put this out there if that's something that really resonates with you. So having that. I really like using this screen. It's uh, the Thompson screen through thought technology. And this one has way too many breaths per second. Um, or maybe I just have it so, so many on one time. But I like it because we have the pacer at the top. There's a muscle tension that I can use or not use. We have the um, the pink is the heart rate and oversimplified. So it just increases and decreases. The purple bluish color is the breathing. I put it around their abdomen. And, and then we're also able to track their HRV in real time on what's going on. Hand temperature, sweat. It tells me a lot of information. So this is my favorite screen to use. It's really cute. It's one of my clients who eight years old, made me 
um, his own breathing pacer out of his his uh, Play-Doh. So I now also have his little Play-Doh of his breathing pacer because he loves it. Um, and, uh, you know, as people learn this, it's really good. I, I had a client today who's, she's uh, 10 and she was, and I work with all ages, but, you know, extra cute when they're little, right? And so she was telling me that she was learning breathing in her music class and they're teaching diaphragmatic, but they're missing a couple of things. So she stepped in and she trained them all on it and it helps them. So, you know, we, we train people and then they train others. So it's really great for that. Want to check in with our client. We mainly want to make sure they're not holding their chest, their breath. That's what the whole time, almost everything I'll sit with my client every single time I check in right here. This is the Achilles for almost everybody is the tension in here. They can get really good at everything else, but we really always want to check in on here. This is not something that you're ever going to master. We always have to check in on mindfulness for it. That bracing pattern is really just going to be uh, the area where we're going to have stress and anxiety. We want to learn how to let go and it's going to come with muscle tension and for our body posture and a whole bunch of other things. We want to keep talking with our clients, um, making sure that they're meeting their goals, how it feels for them. Um, like I said, I do tend to push my clients a little bit more into a certain breathing pace and they always uh, end up being really happy with it later, but you do want to listen to them. So if they really do need to change it, some clients have asthma, we do need to make some changes. So a lot of my asthma clients that are really extreme, we might need to have them breathe it to their belly and then more into their chest. So you're going to learn that through clients based off of how they respond. So listening to clients is really important. They Their opinion will always outweigh any education you have on those things on listening to their bodies because they know what they're experiencing we don't i like using ear kick for at home practices there's a whole bunch of other ones but i'll put this up on the screen for a second it's a company that i've collaborated with i don't have any financial things on it it's just i can put my own breathing pacer in and i have a client screen so i can actually see if they're doing their breathing at home their practices it's free um i like working with the company they're really awesome there's a whole bunch of other ones. I Breathe app is another really great one. Um, this one is Headspace. So you're going to find so many different things out there to practice and have your clients practicing it. So this was really fun. Um, I love talking about this. This is my favorite uh, field. This is how I got into this in 2005. Uh, breathing biofeedback is uh, and everything that I do has been based off of this. So so it's, it's a really good, strong core. I'm really glad that you guys are interested in this and learning more about this. And um, hopefully, I, you know, this is going to be helpful for you and you'll have these tools to go back on. So yeah, thanks so much, you guys. Mm -hmm.